name, I, I'm Renee Bridwell, just in case you don't know. Uh, and today we're looking at Gospel of John chapters four and five. And I have a handout that's been emailed to you all. So two pages full of some pretty detailed stuff on the first story, which is the woman at the well in Samaria. And mostly I'm working from a Bible study notebook that has been going around for years and years. Uh, probably 20, oh, 30 years ago. Wow. You're right. uh, we had our secretary photocopy the Bible pages and enlarge them and then put one column per page so we have plenty of writing room. So I have a little notebook like this, and I have used it through many, many sessions of Bible studies through the years. And boy, is this a real story. Now, you've already heard of the town of Cana once before. Where did we hear Cana? The wedding. The wedding, yes. This is another wedding. Sort of. Oh, even Rebecca's looking at me with an um, odd. I guess I need to do the wedding <laughs> okay. Um, the thing we need to remember first and foremost about reading our New Testament is that it is not a written document so much as it is a transcription of oral tradition. Things that were told to one another, not things that were read to one another. Okay. And when you're talking about oral culture, there are cues that set up what a whole story is going to be. Now, oral culture is still alive and well in our print days like this. Okay? If I start out saying to you, once upon a time, what do you expect to hear? It's <laughs> a fairy tale. Absolutely. See what I mean? Okay. That sets up a particular kind of uh, expectation. If I say to you, a minister, a priest, and a rabbi, <laughs> you're laughing already. It's going to be a joke. Exactly. Those are oral culture, oral culture. Boy, that's hard to say. Alive and well right now. Okay. We have that going on here. Even in the Gospel of John, which has these long, extended theological speeches, usually by Jesus, okay? the oral culture sets up the story. Okay? And so, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, yada, 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 Jesus is making when baptizing more disciples than John, although it wasn't Jesus himself, but his disciples, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. Okay? Here comes one of your first cues. But he had to go through Samaria. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That had to thing. That's why we have a map up here behind me. He's in Judea. Okay. He's headed to, where did I say? He's headed to Galilee. Okay. Started back to Galilee. Now, to you and me, it looks obvious. You go through Samaria, right? Not if you're Jewish. Okay. If you're Jewish, you go over here and around Samaria. It's just like walking on the other side of the street or taking the route through the good part of town because you don't want to go through there where those people live. You know what I mean? Okay. Jews do not go through Samaria because these are the cousins nobody wants to talk about. <laughs> they do not go through Samaria. Okay. Uh, Luke's parable of the Good Samaritan. We're supposed to hear that. Now let me roll your head back to 2001. And I will tell you, this, this offends my anti-racist sensibilities. But it's the best example I could think of at the moment. Okay? On September 12th, the thought of a good Muslim was just anathema. Nobody had heard of such a thing because that's the one thing we knew about those who had flown planes into the towers, okay? That's how good the Samaritan would strike the ears of a Jewish person in Jesus' day. No such thing, okay? So Jews avoided Samaria. They go around, okay? But this says Jesus had to go 
through Samaria. That's another way of saying God sent him through Samaria without saying God sent him. Okay? You will find places in, in the New Testament many times where you have what's called the divine passive. And it's presumed that this is God's voice speaking in this divine passive voice. This is the same kind of thing. He had to go through Samaria, God sent him. And so when you hear that, your oral culture cues are going to tell you this is a divine encounter. This is an encounter God wants him to have. Now, you know the story, right? Jesus goes to the well. What time of day does he go to the well? Noon. It's noon. It goes to the well at noon. You know what happens at the village well at noon? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> exactly. People of the village go to the well when? Morning or night. In the morning or night. Because carrying water is hard work. They go when it's cool. You betcha. So he goes to the well and there's a woman there. Why in the heck is she there at noon? She's avoiding other people. Oh, you <laughs> know this story. What's that? No, she's not avoiding. <laughs> I mean, has this ever been suggested? Because I'm feeling it. Anyway, yes. Yeah. Nobody, well, else, nobody likes her. Uh, exactly. Person. Rebecca, you and I both. <laughs> she's not a morning person. I have a, a friend in our church in Escondido who says that. Uh, she has a friend who doesn't believe in God before noon. <laughs> She's talking about someone who's a radical night person. <laughs> so noon is an unusual time. She might be a social outcast. You see this in verse six here on your handout sheet. It may also be kind of a hint for Jesus' crucifixion, which is the other big noon event in the gospel. Maybe a hint. When it's an oral culture, these little cues, they, they kind of ping for you. And, and you pick it up. Because you don't have a written text to go back and look at. Just no such thing. So she's there at noon. She's a Samaritan. And Jesus speaks to her. Men do not speak to women they don't know. <coughs> Jews do not speak to Samaritans. Period. Hello. Hello. Sorry. That's all right. We were late to. So what's the first thing you know about Jesus from this? He has a poor drink of water. He wants a drink of water. It's hot. He's tired. He's, he's thirsty. He wants some water. You also know about him. He does not care about these boundaries. Mm -hmm. These social boundaries do not mean anything to him. Because God had him go through Samaria. There's an encounter he has to have. And this is it. So. Quite a conversation, huh? He says, give me a drink. His disciples have gone into the city to buy food, probably Shechem, which is, here's the Sychar, where he is for the well. There's Shechem right next to it. They've probably gone there. Okay, now the difference with these two is the little village with two or three houses and a well, and the city big enough to have a major market or something. Anyway, there, there's a way that they can buy food in, in the city. There isn't in, in Sychar. They're gone, so it's just these two, which makes the conversation even more remarkable because, yikes. Okay. Now, one thing you need to know about wells, I didn't tell you this when we first started. This is a wedding scene. The local well is where the young unmarried women go in order to meet young unmarried men. <laughs> it's not just the place to catch up on the news around the village. It's also the place where these engagement encounters happen. 
So we've had the wedding in Cana. Okay? And then in chapter 3, verse 25. You have your Bibles open? Somebody read John chapter 3, verse 25. Tell us what John is saying about Jesus. Now a discussion about purification arose between John, John's disciples and a Jew. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan to whom you testified here, here he is baptizing and all are around and all are going to him. John answered, no one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has, has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. And that's far enough. Thank you. Did I tell you it's a wedding scene. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. John. John's the groomsman. Yeah. Jesus is the bridegroom. He's at the well and he meets the Samaritan woman. Okay. This is back to the minister, priest, and the rabbi line, right? Okay. If you know you're going to hear a joke here, you have the bridegroom. And a woman who does not have a husband, it's a wedding scene. And I actually probably we should call it a betrothal scene, but you know. Um, the Old Testament is full of these stories. So um, she says to him, How in the world could you get a drink? Or ask me to get you a drink. You don't have a bucket, and you all don't talk to people like me. Uh, Jesus is from the southern part of Judea. Mm -hmm. And, and his, his, his speech if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for water. Mm -hmm. He talks about living water. What yeah. is living water? Jesus. Water that bubbles. Water that bubbles. Absolutely. You're right. But we're not going to get there. Yeah, quite I don't want to I'm just I'm just yeah. 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 Uh, living water is water that is moving as opposed to stagnant. Okay, water that has a scum on top, nobody wants to dip into. Okay? That water just sitting there breeding mosquitoes and growing pond scum. That is not living water. But the babbling brook, that's living water. Okay? But there's the double meaning that Jesus talks about here. He talks about living water that gushes up in you to eternal life. Mm -hmm. okay? That's like an artesian well, the kind of spring that just springs from the ground. And you can't help you know, but notice that, the freshness of it. That's living water. And Jesus says, if you ask, ask me, I would give you living water, not well water. Okay? That's the core of the story right there. That is the core of the story. Um, verse 12. Okay. I have a lot of notes here. I gave you plenty of white space to write on around if you wanted to. Would you take it along? Oh, yeah. oh absolutely. Uh, Please, those are yours right all, all over. Right. Okay. Uh, in my English <laughs> translation, Sorry. verse 12 reads The woman saying to Jesus, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? And with his sons and his flocks drank from it. It's a very ancient well with deep religious and social history behind it. 
Yeah. Now, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? Sounds like a simple informational question, right? It's because some things are harder to translate in Greek without being really interpretive. Okay. So I'm going to be really interpretive and tell you that if we were speaking Greek, she would be saying, you can't possibly be greater than our ancestor Jacob. <laughs> now that's kind of a question, but it's really a statement disguised as a question. Yeah. Okay. Well, she doesn't believe that he could possibly provide better water than Jacob. Yeah. 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 And Jesus says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. That's life in the desert for you right there. Yeah. But I will give you water that will gush up to eternal life. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Now she knows we're not really talking about water anymore. Yeah, yeah she knows that. Right. Mm -hmm. But she wants some of this water because mm -hmm. you know, coming to the well in the heat of the day is not fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. Now, he also tells her that she lost my train of thought. Okay. Yeah, she, right. She says, I don't have a husband. Yeah. And he tells her, oh, well, yeah, that's right. Because the guy you're living with isn't your husband and you've had five before him. Hmm. Yeah, who is right. <laughs> Especially for, for Jews who were only allowed to marry three times, regardless of that Leveric marriage thing that you've heard about. Where if the brother dies and doesn't have any children, then she has to marry the next brother whether she wants to or not because mm. she now belongs to that family and has to produce children mm. okay. so oh here's the thing i was going for the hebrew word for husband not greek hebrew is baal if you've read much in the old testament you've probably run into that as a term for foreign gods baal all it means is master. The Hebrew term for a husband is master. Now, being my feminist self, I'm not real crazy about that. <laughs> but, but, but hang on to that thought because we're going to come into the word for wife here in just a moment. Okay. Um, but she understands from his statement about her life that has no, ba no obvious basis. She understands that he must be some kind of a smart guy. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Okay. Now she's Samaritan. Okay. The Samaritans are cousins of the Jewish people. Okay. When the Jewish nation was overrun and the leadership and a lot of the educated part of the country were taken off into exile in Babylon. They didn't take everybody. They only took the, the worthy people, the ones they really wanted, and there were folks left behind all over. This is the origin of the Samaritan people, the ones who were left behind when the stands were taken off into exile. And so they have this, this common experience. They come back after, after the exile is over, they come back and they're rebuilding. And then there's all these cousins that were left behind and didn't go. And that begins the separation. We've been through this horrible thing. You haven't, you can't possibly understand. We're more pure than you. God has tested us and refined us. That's where the Samaritans come from. But they come from the same stock. Okay? You know, she says, our ancestor Jacob. Okay? She's claiming Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? The folks in Samaria had only the scriptures that we call the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay? Or if you're Jewish, you call that the law. So they only recognize that, that bit, that five books. And there's some folks, some commentators who look at her five husbands and think, 
and see their hint of the five books. I don't know if there's much to be gained from that other than, gee, that's a cute bit of trivia. But, but there it is. Okay? I will share that. When she says, I say that you are a prophet, she doesn't mean Isaiah and Jeremiah. Because those are not prophets to her. They don't have special status. She means Moses, who was called a prophet. Now, prophets to Samaritans are not those who tell you what your future is going to be. They're not the ones who interpret the present day to help you see what's coming next. Prophet to a Samaritan is one who will teach, who will instruct, who will judge disputes and settle questions. But when she says, sir, I see you are a prophet, she means in the tradition of Moses. Our ancestors, she says, this is chapter or verse 20. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, and she's probably pointing at it. Right? Mount Gerizim is right there. This well is at the base of Mount Gerizim, and it has become the center of worship for Jewish, for Samaritan people, the residents of Samaria, while the Jews have been carried off to Babylon. And she says, but you say, and that's a plural you, meaning y'all, <laughs> your people say that worship happens in Jerusalem. And Jesus says to her, wife, believe me, or woman, believe me. The word is the same. Okay. We keep getting echoes of this engagement scene. The hour is coming when you, again, plural, you all, when you all, will worship the Father neither here nor there, but in spirit and in truth. So both of them have become, in a sense, spokespeople for their people. They both take on that role. The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. Did I say Jesus gets theological? <laughs> when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus has lots of encounters with people. But there's not a lot of sermonizing that follows out of them, typically. Or when there is, the sermonizing is on the order of, more in the order of proverbs and axioms and instructions for living. Now that's a real broad brush and you can find lots of exceptions. But in general, that's what you find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In John, when you have an encounter of Jesus with someone, okay, there begins long theological discourse, also known as a sermon. So does that make us prophets? I mean, Those of us who's what the audience thinks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I do want to point out verse 22. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. That phrase, the Jews, you'll see a lot in the Gospel of John. And I heard Rebecca in the first session talking about being very careful about how we read that. It's easy to put in anti-Jewish anti-Semitic slant on these things. Um, I spent so much time talking about the Samaritans and the Jews as cousins, that other branch of the family, because we need to remind ourselves every time we see this, what we're talking about here is not the other, we're talking about the brother and the sister that you love to hate and hate to love. This is a family squabble when you run into statements about the Jews. Now, this is not one of those that's particularly demeaning. It's not typically used as a slam text. Oh, it's attached to the word we. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, the Jews, are the ones bringing themselves. Yeah. But it's, it's not typically used in that way, except for the 
of what sounds like the superiority of the text. And I will tell you, you get my sister and me together and uh, there may be a little bit of a pushing contest. <laughs> my grandchildren are way cuter than hers. <laughs> But you've seen them, you know that. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you've seen half of them anyway. Um, so we need to, to remember that. This is, uh, when we read it, it, it's that internal dispute. Now, move on down to verse 26. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. She is expecting a prophet like Moses, and she uses that term Messiah. Uh, she's expecting him to be a teacher and guide. He will proclaim all things. Again, that's in the tradition of Moses. When you read the Synoptic Gospels, when you see this expectation of a Messiah, it's more like they're expecting a warrior king who will overthrow the Roman government and establish a new Jewish government. Two different kinds of expectations here. Jesus responds, I am. Now, if your Bible is the Pentateuch, the only proper name for God is I am. And so suddenly she's hearing and seeing this guy in a whole different way. He's not just a prophet like Moses. He is the one they've been expecting. It's a revelation story, and she marries herself to this revelation. And then that scene closes. Think of this as a drama. The curtains close on Jesus and the woman at the well. And very quickly, she's off stage, and here come the disciples bringing the subway bags. <laughs> or something. <laughs> Probably not. Okay. Now, while they're coming, they have seen him talking to a woman. They're amazed. He's been talking to a woman? But they didn't dare question him. The woman left her water jar and went back to the city. I want you to, when you see that, I want you to read that and think, she left her purse. Do you ever just abandon your purse, ladies? And on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. She was so excited, so enthused with the spirit from this encounter, she left her jar behind. That's a crucial part of everyday life. It's how you get life-giving water to your family. But she said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? Okay. Again, Greek has some constructions that don't really convey well into English. This is the kind of Grammatically, the kind of question that expects a yes answer. He can't be the Messiah, can he? Yeah, he is. That's that question. That's what that question is. Mm -hmm. It expects a yes. We do our best to write him that way in English, but too far into that, and someone said, oh no, you're interpreting now. Okay. And so our, our good translations try to avoid being too far with it, but you got to know it's there. She's saying, yes, he is. Meanwhile, the disciples are saying to him, aren't you hungry? And he says, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Jesus' food, verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do we have a question on, on Zoom? Oh, that's your phone. Okay. <laughs> I thought I heard someone on Zoom talking. No problem. Um, I want to move on down to 39. 
where it says many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. She said it, they believed, which I find remarkable again, because she is a woman. A woman. Exactly. So the Samaritans came to Jesus. He stayed there two days and many more believed because of their direct encounter with him. And they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said, but we've seen and heard for ourselves. This is truly the savior of the world. And John sets up what we call the Samaritan mission. In the other gospels, there is no such thing. And in fact, you see uh, statements like Jesus came to uh, reach the Jews. You won't see the Samaritan mission anywhere in the other Gospels. The Gospel of John, you heard in the first session, was written later than the other Gospels. It's written after the time that the church has begun to reach farther out into the countryside. Paul has already done his thing. He's gone as far as Rome with this. And the message about Jesus is going beyond the original audience. And we see that here at the very beginning of the Gospel of John. I think that's wonderful. That concludes the story of the woman at the well. Now, I put lots and lots of notes on the handout. Um, some of it is more detailed than what I mentioned here. I want to summarize all of this by pointing it to verse 39. And somebody who's really quick on finding things could turn to John chapter 20, verse 30. Who can get there first? Read just that one verse. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Keep going. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Okay. That's the purpose of the gospel. Chapters one through four are building up toward that. And we have that statement right here. We have heard for um it said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we might need but because of the testimony we've heard for ourselves. This is the purpose of the gospel right here. And when you get to chapter 20, the end of the gospel proper, there's an epilogue, but the end of the gospel proper, that's the summary statement. These are written so that you may believe. Believe first starts with the Samaritans. I find that remarkable. <laughs> an interesting perspective that John brings. So we have about 15 minutes to move on and cover chapter five, well, and the rest of chapter four. Then he came again to Cana in Galilee. I want you to know, they're moving along. Sychar to Cana is about a two days walk. No, probably more than that, because it's about two days because of the geology as well as the distance from Cana to Capernaum. Um, I forget which is which here. But he comes again to Cana in Galilee, where he changed the water into wine. Again, that cue that reminds you. We started in Cana in chapter two. We're going to end chapter four in Cana. Now, there was a royal official whose son was ill in Capernaum. Here's the two days walk from Cana to Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come up from Judea to Galilee, he begged him to come heal his son. There's not an exact parallel, but there are very similar stories in Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 7. Neither of those is at a distance. This one is at a distance. Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Signs is one of those code words for John. We already had the first sign. What was it? 
last week. <laughs> Y'all were here. I watched you on the video. Mm -hmm. Water. Water. Tessa, what was the first sign? Water into wine. Turning water into uh, wine <laughs> at the wedding. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, did that look like whiskey? What the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonders are something different. Yeah. Signs have that specific purpose of pointing toward Jesus, uh, Jesus' glory, his ministry, his divinity. Okay. Wonders are miraculous acts that may or may not have that other driving purpose behind them. The official said, sir, please come before my boy dies. He's pleading. I would be too. Jesus said, go, your son will live. And he went because he believed Jesus. Or maybe he was resigned to the fact that Jesus wasn't going to come. I don't know. But he went because Jesus said so. Whatever he expects, we don't know. And while he's on the way, the servants come and say, he turned the corner, he's gonna live, the fever broke. And when they compare notes, they find that the fever broke at about the same time that Jesus said, go, your son will live. This is healing at a distance. And so he believes. That's the purpose of the, this whole story. He believes. Now John doesn't say anything about all those other people who were sick or hungry or anything else. The focus is on this one. And this was the second sign. What are signs for? They point toward Jesus. They point, point you toward something, absolutely. I have, uh, one of the first times I came here, I was looking around for signs that say, best room. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's why it doesn't exist. It and, and, you know, there, there's, there's a sign right back there on the, on the doorway. And so I knew it would be somewhere in that vicinity. <laughs> I know how to read signs. Yeah. The author of the Gospel of John hopes that we know how to read signs here as well. Sign number one, the wedding. Sign number two, or water into wine at the wedding. Sign number two, healing the royal official's son. Chapter five, uh, well, chapters two through four are a unit that begins in Cana and ends in Cana. That's that oral culture thing. When you hear Cana, you're going to hear this unit that begins with a wedding, ends with a betrothal scene, and then in the middle has John saying that of Jesus that he is the bridegroom. That's setting up who Jesus is the reader or the hearer i should say um because obviously these eventually took written form but this was an originally first and oral thing what has this this completion this inclusion of cana to cana with the two episodes there now the first story in chapter five i love <laughs> after this there's a festival Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there's a pool called Bethsatha. That's a hard one to say. When I took my Hebrew class, we were joking that you had to, ha had to be a shepherd with asthma to be able to speak Hebrew properly. <laughs> getting our mouths around the, the vowel sounds and the uh, consonant pairings was, was a challenge. Now, you know from other Gospels that this is a pool where there's a lot of healing that goes on. It's a place where those who need healing collect. In these were many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. That's a long time. Yes. Yeah. When Jesus saw him lying there, knew that it had been a long time, and said to him, do you want to be made well? I want you to think about that question. For the last 37 years and 360 days, your life has been, go to the pool, lie there and wait. 
Jesus says, do you want to be made well? And the first answer is, well, of course, because that's why I come here every day. And the second answer is, oh my goodness, how will my life change? I can't handle that much change in my life. Maybe I should just stay where I am because this is comfortable. I know how it works. Being ill, being lame, has been so much a part of his identity for so long that Jesus has to ask, do you want to be made well? Think about that. I've gone to preaching. I shouldn't be preaching. This is teaching. <laughs> but think about that question. Do you want to face the change? The new set of expectations, the new set of responsibilities, the new set of personal openness that would come with health. If I'm ill, somebody else has to do the cooking and the cleaning and bring me my food. If I'm healthy, I have to do that for myself. Do you want to be made well? And he says, oh, <laughs> but I don't have anyone to put me in the water so I can get well. So here I lie, not my fault. Hear that question? Kind of a sad situation. Jesus says to him, stand up. Take your mat and walk. I love that story. Oh, I do too. I, I do know too. a song about that story, actually. <laughs> there is a song about that one. Yeah. It's called Me Walk. Now, all of this happens on Sabbath. This is the first mention of Sabbath in the book, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and the Jews said to the man who had been cured, don't you know it's against the law for you to carry something on the Sabbath? Notice they question him. They don't question Jesus. They don't go to Jesus and say, it's against the law for you to be doing medical work on the Sabbath. They go to this man and say, why are you carrying your mat? I think that's interesting. I don't have any good insights out of that, except that maybe it's, Maybe Jesus is a little too authoritative. They don't dare approach him because he's got that look. You know the look? <laughs> she has that look. <laughs> she has that look. Uh -huh. I, uh, I remember a story from, from my childhood. Uh, the mother of these two boys, the two boys sat in the choir, in the back row of the choir. Mom was out in the congregation. Well, the two boys are pretty rowdy. But she gives them the look and they straighten up right now. They know better than to encounter that look. <laughs> I think maybe Jesus has that about him. You know, we get it looking all that. And it does say he disappeared into the crowd. So this the the mallet, the guy who was healed is the easy target. Why are you carrying the mat? <laughs> And then they ask him, who said to you, take it up and walk? Well, it was that guy. And that discussion, that back and forth, goes on uh, very quickly, verses 10 through 16. This is, this is on your notes. I guess I should turn it over. Get on the right page. That's in the notes. And then in verse 17, Jesus starts talking and keeps talking and talking and talking and talking. The rest of the chapter is Jesus talking. Now I put in your notes, it's in bold face and italics on that second side. This is a typical structure stories in John. There is some kind of an action, some activity, followed by dialogue about it, sometimes a controversy. In fact, I would say probably most of the time it's a controversy of some kind, which launches an extended dialogue. We saw it in chapter three with Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night. 
and we get to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And somewhere after that, it becomes the narrator of the gospel talking, but it's hard to know where to close the, the quotation marks because the Greek texts don't have punctuation. Heck, they don't even have word spacing. It's continuous letters. Very, very interesting to try to read that. No. Yeah, hashtags would be nice, wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to bring up one thing about the testimony because we have choir starting in five minutes. Okay. I want to bring up one thing about Jesus' extended dialogue. And that is if you turn over to verse 31. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. This comes from an, the ancient legal system of figuring out the, uh, the answer to a, a dispute, a crime, you know, solving those issues, requires the testimony of two or more witnesses. Now Jesus can say, I'm the one sent from God. But unless that's verified by two or three other witnesses, it's just the guy talking. So he goes on in that section that begins at verse 31 to name the other witnesses. John the Baptist is one. His own actions are one. The father and scripture. He names four other witnesses, so to speak, picking up on that ancient expectation of two or more witnesses. Now, when you see the word scripture, verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them, yada, yada, yada. What was Jesus' scripture? We read that and we tend to think this whole Bible. The New Testament did not exist. When you see scriptures in the New Testament, generally what's being referred to at that time by that person is what we would call the law and the prophets. And you'll see the phrase, the law and the prophets, many times. Okay? The law is Genesis through De Deuteronomy. The first five books of what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. The prophets is not only Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, but it also includes Joshua, Judges, the books of Samuel, the books of Kings. I listed them on the page for you. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and what are uh, Jewish friends would call the book of the 12, what is often called in Christian nomenclature too often, the minor prophets. I resist that language because there's nothing minor about those folks. You just call them the shorter prophets. Exactly. The more succinct prophets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, because they were one scroll, typically. And so it was one book with all of these. Uh, a tidbit for you, First and Second Samuel. We it's broken up because it wouldn't fit on a single scroll. Mm -hmm. That's the only difference, the only distinction. Same with Kings. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fit on one scroll, so it's broken into two. Okay. Now the writings is the third section, and these were not yet being considered scripture. Mm -hmm. okay. And that includes things like Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, the book of Ruth, Psalms, the Proverbs. Those things were in circulation. Their contents were in circulation, but they had not yet attained the status of being considered Holy Scripture. So when you see Scripture in your New Testament, think the Law and the Prophets. If you heard my alarm ringing just then, it was five minutes till 10. <laughs> I did that because I tend not to pay attention to the clock much. 
Uh, there are lots more notes on the handout that I gave you. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about any of this anytime. So if you have questions that arise in your own reading, feel free. I have a question. Certainly. This last feeling we just had, it does not say that in the signs, correct? This is not the third sign. No, it okay. does not say that. It seems a little bit arbitrary. This one gets the sign. It does. It really does. Yeah. Okay. I think that's, yeah. Okay. The book of Canaan has uh, those two signs, one to start, one to, one to finish. And then we launch it from chapter five into 12. We're going to have a whole lot more stuff. That's a little different in character than the opening segments there. Okay. It's time to go to choir. All right. Thank you all on Zoom. Oh, well, thank you very much.